All right, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about bridging the divide, and, and just it's a pep talk, and it follows perfectly after Jonathan. So we can do it. And before I start, I just need to thank everyone, and especially thanks to John Downing, who nominated me, um, the people who contributed to that nomination, the selection committee. I also want to make a special shout out to Bob Chen, who's hopefully somewhere in the room. He is fearless and tireless and an inspiration in terms of combining science, research, and education. And he's tireless, believe me, I work with him a lot. Um, I also probably, I'm sorry if I'm, am I being really inconsistent with my mic? Okay. Um, I also feel like I should thank the, all these scientists that I've browbeat into doing outreach over the years, because there's a lot of them. So, yes. All right, so I, I did my graduate work at Davis, um, UC Davis, and uh, it's, uh, it was kind of a long path to get there because I did a five-year undergraduate that was basically because I love field work. So I took every field work class I could. I loved ecology and field work. And um, spent some time away from school and at 27 went to Davis. Now it's amazing I got in because I didn't contact any professors. I didn't do any of the proper steps. It's not what I would tell my daughter to do. Um, but I got in and ended up in Charles Goldman's group. Um, which also has uh, Warwick Vincent as one of its former members who's a previous winner of the Margalef Award. So I really didn't know much about limnology. I didn't know much about UC Davis. And in fact, it was a while before I realized that enology was not ecology spelled wrong. <laughs> so I'm from Minnesota. Hey, it's not my fault. So. Um, thanks to Goldman's um, amazing collection of students, I did find a home in limnology and I love it. Um, but here's the thing, people. I'm not a Margalef, and I'm not a Warwick Vincent, okay? Margalef had 58 publications by the time he was 30. Warwick got through his uh, PhD in three years. Uh, I have taken a much more wandering path, but I have to tell you I ended up in the right place. I, the work I do, I'm absolutely passionate about, and it's about connecting science, scientists, and the real world, um, because we have so much to offer. To make sure, yeah. And finally, one day, once I'd known Goldman long enough, I said, well, why did you take me on? I don't think I even had the word water in my application. And he said, well, you'd been to Antarctica. I figured you must be cool. Um, <laughs> If you know Charles, that makes sense. Um, and of course, there's a, several Goldmanites who have a legacy in Antarctica, including Warwick Vincent and John Priscu. Um, I, too, have a legacy in Antarctica. It's just a little bit different. So I was a sheet metal worker there. And um, that is a, uh, a vehicle that was trapped under the ice or under the snowpack at the South Pole for quite a while. And uh, my boss and I pulled it out and repaired the body of it. You like the work we did? It's pretty nice, huh? And then over here in McMurdo, there are still some dorms that have my ductwork in them, just so you know. So mind you, I had zero construction when I went down there. Um, NSF was requiring the contractors to hire women for the first time to do construction. And so um, there were many, many guys down there, many who didn't want us there. They thought we were very threatening. They were sure that we would cave and be gone before the season was over. Now, yeah, I am getting to what we're supposed to be talking about. Here's the deal. I think we're doing the same thing when we think about the public. I think we are totally underestimating the ability of non-scientists to absorb and understand science. I don't think the problem is ability or capacity. I think it's the disconnect. Um, and guess whose job it's gonna be to fix that? It's gonna be ours. So um, we can no longer be the scientists, the liberal el elite. Um, we've got to work very, very hard to take bigger steps. I have to say that if I hadn't had an amazing mentor in my first boss in Antarctica, there's no way I would have survived. 
and we need to do the same thing for the public and for educators, et cetera. Make sure I'm on the right slide. Yeah, so uh, I was digging through some of the stuff that Margalef has said, and one of them was, nature should be looked at with the eyes of a child, inquisitive and searching, which do not take anything for granted and question everything. And frankly, I think people are systems thinkers, and I think that they're arguably ecologists when they're born. And I think we kind of groom it out of them with the way we parse courses, the way we parse experiences. Um, and if you think about a, just a, water, a watershed, watersheds are nested, right? If you only consider one little sub-watershed um, and don't look at the rest of the system, we're gonna have problems. You know, there will be problems downstream. So I think we do that a lot in many disciplines. Um, here's one of my favorite examples. Um, I was at a lecture by an economist and uh, he kept talking about continued growth, continued growth, continued growth, um, um, infinite growth. And I went up afterwards and I was like, what? We live on a finite planet. And he said, oh, that's not a problem. Technology will save us. And I thought, okay, well, you, you might want to broaden your view of systems. Um, I don't know. I don't get it. Um, then I think about the degree programs we have. Um, civil engineering, my brother is a wastewater engineer, and he's really good at what he does, but he really doesn't understand natural systems. He didn't have time in the undergraduate coursework for an engineering degree. When do you have time to learn about water, really? And a good example is what's happened to the Mississippi River Delta. You know, we we're really good at engineering in that levee system, but the very levee system that's supposed to be protecting us from floods is causing the wetlands to disappear because there's no sediment to sustain them, which means the floods get worse. So the point being, we can't work alone. We can't have one discipline not working with others. I know you know this in your head, and I'm saying it to try to really spur us on, in a sense, to action. Um, another example. These are the upper division life science education degree requirements for uh, students at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Now, they have to take all these education classes. They have to be capable in everything from human anatomy to ecology. It's not surprising that they don't get all the courses they probably should. But those poor teachers, when they get out of school, if they haven't gone back to school or gone to some exceptional school, they're really not ready to teach messy science. They are afraid of messy science, many of them, because I work with educators all the time and I know that. And I think we are the people that need to help them get there. And that's what has driven a lot of the work that we do is shipboard workshops and things like that. So now that I've got you all kind of, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Um, I have a question. How many people in here are, raise your hand, are tenured or tenure track faculty? Look around. All right, how many are graduate students? All right, this is my real lecture right this second. If you are a tenured faculty member or a tenure track and you aren't forcing your students out into the world of outreach, communication, community interaction, then you're failing your students. And I, I feel that pretty strongly. It's a strong statement. But we are no longer at a time when we can get away with just being hiding in a corner in our science world, even though we still need to be based on truth and objectivity. Um, I, uh, as I was thinking, thinking about that, I uh, looked up uh, some papers, and this is kind of a really dismal paper, but it's a perfect one to freak you out. So um, Nature did something in the UK with 6,000 PhD candidates, 75% indicated they wanted an academic career, and three to 4% of them are estimated to be able to get there. So what are the rest of those people going to be doing? What skills are they going to need when they get out in the world? Well, it's our job as their mentors to help them get those skills. And that means don't push them to only do research because 
you're really cheating them. Um, let's see, where am I going? Okay, and so now, now just a couple little uh, tips, and I'm not watching my time, so hopefully so. Oh, I see, I've got it. Um, research by AAAS in 2014 showed that the primary way scientists engage at that time, at least, was still primarily talking to people, right? You give a public talk, you um, talk to the press, you do blogging, maybe, social media, things like that. If you think about it, that's all very one-way communication. And who comes when it's a talk, a public talk on science? The people who already like science. So it's not getting us to the ones we really need to get to. Um, and there's a ton of research out there, I'm sure you've bumped into some of it, that just giving people information does not change cultural norms and it does not change behavior. So keep that in your mind. I, uh, every year, I have many master science and PhD science students come to me and say, I really, really need to learn about communication and outreach, help me, what could I do? They come to Sea Grant, they come to all of us. And um, they shouldn't have to go chasing on their own. You should know about us and be helping them. So instead of the sage on the stage mentality, um, I think it's really important that we all, like Jonathan talked about, get out there and understand people's values, understand prior knowledge, understand cultural perspectives, indigenous knowledge, listen. There's a lot to be learned by talking to people with indigenous knowledge or local knowledge. They know a whole lot that we haven't tested yet and so we haven't gotten into. And be there to exchange ideas and provide personal contact. So the other cool thing is you're not in it alone. There's bridges everywhere to help you kind of cross the divide, right? I mean, there's Sea Grant, there's National Alliance for Broader Impacts, which has a ton of good information, informal science institutions, and many, many others. So Margalef again, his teaching philosophy was to provide plenty of leads for others to follow and explore. But he didn't feed them to them. It had to be um, one's own willingness to take advantage of those things. And I worked at Bell Museum in Minneapolis for a year early on, and we, it was terrifying because we were told never answer a question with the answer. Only answer it with another question. Now, if you think about it, it's kind of hard. How do you do it? Well, what do you think? You know, think about it. Yeah. Because that's how people actually learn. And they don't need to just know the facts. They need to be able to assess the credibility of that stuff. They have to be able to communicate it to others meaningfully before they truly understand it. And then they have the opportunity to make informed and responsible decisions. Now I've got a minute only, a minute and a half to just tell you about a few sort of what I think are really hallmark programs. We have a lot of them. We never run out of ideas as outreach people because that's the way our brains work. We run out of money, time, and partners. So come on in, you know. Um, one of the ones I'm really proud of is the Center for Great Lakes Literacy, which was founded under NSF funding from COSI, back when NSF was doing COSI. And EPA loved their role, their connection to us enough that we've been continually funded now since 2005 to do at least our shipboard component of what we do. So this summer we're taking eight mentor teachers, meaning they have some shipboard experience, and eight new teachers, most of whom are like teachers in the same schools as the mentors on a week trip on a three-masted schooner to learn about science, sailing, the physics of sailing, and shipwrecks and maritime history. So that's why I'm not retired, guys. It's super fun. Um, and the whole premise of this is to connect scientists very closely to the teachers and therefore their students in a giant community of practice throughout the Great Lakes. We're really proud of it. Um, we've had, I'm uh, at zero, can I go one more minute? People who know? 
I'm looking at you guys. Let's see. Okay, I'll be quick. I'll be quick. I promise. So, um, so we've had you know scientists who like struggle and struggle and struggle to explain uh, food webs and stable isotopes, uh, and then a year later had built a lesson along with a Great Lakes Aquarium um, educator called Fish CSI that um, used stable isotopes to figure out where the um, poaching was happening on sturgeon. And the last one I want to mention, I'll, all I'll say is that um, Water on the Web, if you've ever heard of it, is a really good example of a project that was a matter of scientists coming to educators and coming to outreach people and saying, we've got these data. Let's make them accessible to schools, teachers, uh, undergraduates, community colleges, et cetera. Um, Rich Axler was a really big part of that, along with some other people. And uh, it's 12 years. It uh, was funded in, I'm, this is my last sentence, honest. It was funded in 1997. Um, it hasn't been maintained for 12 years, and it's still, I'm sorry, John Downing, but I think it still gets more hits per year than um, the Sea Grant website. Um, teaches real data. And finally, here's my summary slide that I don't really need to go through because I think I've already lectured all of you enough. So um, I just want to thank you and I'm so proud and excited to be here. Thanks.